no one gets to choose their parents, we all inherit a story, like it or not. But we can choose what to do with that story. I'm Mike Joseph. The story my parents gave me was full of life and loss, wars, genocide and ethnic cleansing. What should I do with that legacy? What would you do? I was 50 before I did anything at all. Welcome to Keys, a troubled inheritance. It's October 1919. My grandfather, Israel Gold, has survived the First World War, soldiering in the Austro-Hungarian army. He's returned to his adopted city of Leipzig in Germany to marry Sophie, start in international fur trading, and start a family. His new life will be in a new Republican Germany. He knows nothing about the brief flowering of liberal democracy in new Republican Ukraine. By the time my mother Lily is born in 1920, Ukraine has been replaced by Poland, where Jews, including Israel's mother and siblings, will be an increasingly oppressed minority, second-class citizens. His fur trade takes him frequently to Poland, so he knows how things are there, and he does not like it. But this new Germany, he does like. He was a very active, idealistic, enterprising and capable man. Very talented, very gifted, a brilliant linguist. On her 78th birthday in 1998, my mother Lily recorded her memories for the Survivors of the Shoah Foundation, an archive of testimony created by Steven Spielberg after the success of Schindler's List. He learned everything from nature, countryside, mountaineering, walking, cycling, uh, music, literature, everything that was good in the world, in fact. Israel's father, Leib, worked in the timber industry before the First World War, and the young boy grew up in the mountains and forests of West Ukraine. Now, leading a city life, he kept that connection to nature. I remember he used to go cycling early in the morning, just as a, for pleasure. One morning he came home and he said, come here, I have something to show you. He had picked up a hedgehog in the park that ran across his path and he picked it up in his handkerchief very carefully and brought it home to show us children. We were quite young at the time. And there was this hedgehog in the kitchen. His handkerchief was like a sieve, all perforated with the thorns of this hedgehog. He showed it to us and he wrapped it up carefully, took it back to the park to release it. It was so typical of him. And did you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I had two sisters and a brother. And what were their names? Uh, Rosa was the, my younger sister. Then there was Wolfgang, he was five years younger. And the little one, Dorothea, she was uh, eight years younger than I. So you were the oldest? I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. Born in 1920, my mother Lily was the oldest. So while her family life was Jewish, her education was in state schools in a cosmopolitan German city, a world centre for publishing and music, and home to one of Europe's great trade fairs. Change came in 1933, when her parents removed her from the state school she loved, with what she thought at the time was an excess of caution. Hitler had just come to power and they, they were very, my parents were very concerned that we would uh, suffer persecution at the school or at least discrimination. Uh, my sister had also started there, she had been there one year and I had been there three years and then they raised the school fees to double for Jewish children. And uh, my parents decided for those two reasons, the very high school fees and the fear of, of anti-Semitism, they were going to remove us. How did you feel about leaving your school? Very sad. I was doing very well there. I had a very, very nice form master who was not a Nazi and he had great uh, uh, regard for me, I think. I did well in, in all subjects. And um, when my parents came to see him, uh, 
he pleaded with him to leave me there and he said that he would give me his personal protection, that nobody would raise a finger against me. And the parents were very impressed by this, but they didn't want to change their minds because he was not the only teacher. Some of them were not such anti-Nazis as he was. And sure enough, after some time, he was removed from the school by the Nazis and sent to some village school, some obscure village school, because he was a social democrat. Nazi pressure on Jews was only just beginning, but in neighbouring Poland, long before the Nazi invasion, an ethnically intolerant regime was already making life tough for Jews. The consequence was felt in Israel Gold's own family. In 1934, while Israel Gold's work and life in Germany still continued much as it had since 1920, his younger brother, in the Polish province of Galicia, already felt driven to leave his home and emigrate to Palestine. On the 24th of January 1935, Israel wrote to his brother Yosef. This letter gave my daughter Asha and myself food for thought. Dear Joseph, at last you achieved your goal, and so your future will be secured, probably. If only our brothers and sisters could manage to come out of unhappy Galicia. Your detailed report pleases and interests us. Lily has a great interest in news of Palestine too. She's a convinced Zionist and an active member of the Jewish Scout Association. How are relations with the Arabs? Try getting along in peace and friendship. It's likely to be important. If you get the opportunity to buy a cheap piece of land near to the mountains, please let me know. How are relations with the Arabs? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's actually the first question he asks his brother. It's high up on his agenda. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that generation, the settler generation, mm -hmm. had to face the fact that they were a tiny European minority coming into a majority Asian country, an Arab country, a Palestinian land. There was no illusion that there were no Palestinians there. Far from it. He recognises that they're incomers mm -hmm. and it is, in effect, the situation that European colonisers have discovered for centuries. Uh, you either go in armed with you know, weapons or replacing the native population, or you go in aiming to coexist. And Israel's agenda, Israel Gold's agenda, is clearly to coexist. Yes. A month and a half later, March the 3rd, 1935. You have to work as a sentry for a long time, or is it only temporary? How do the neighbouring Arabs behave? It would be fine to communicate and to live in peace, together with this similar race of people in future. It feels good for us here that our homeland grows and flourishes again, and we can prove to all that the Jews can also have great achievements. With a similar race of people, as he says. That is a fascinating point Isn't it? he makes. <laughs> A sort of a self-serving myth. In some way, uh, the Palestinians, once they are re reassured of, of our goodwill, uh, are going to accept that, look, it's our long-lost cousins, they'll fall on each other's necks in, in eternal friendship, mm -hmm. and, and it'll be, you know, the New Jerusalem, literally. Um, whether there is or was any substance in that at all hardly matters. Mm -hmm. It was a comforting myth, but it was a myth that Israel Gold found important. His whole experience in Europe was precisely about getting along with different people. I mean, you couldn't grow up in, in Poland and Ukraine in, in those days without getting along with other people, because there were always other people, different, you know, races, cultures, languages, religions, to, to get on with every day of your life. Sure. And, you know, so it was nothing unusual. Our position is that Zionism and our country's expansion and flourishing will give us a spiritual home, especially for the young. Palestine is the only hope. And if I stay for a further two to three years and it remains advisable to go to Eretz Israel, it will be easier than now with the youngsters not yet in work. But that's, that's what I'm wondering, you know, from what I've heard from him. He's somebody that would have happily spent the rest of his life in Leipzig, and that this idea of Palestine was for the generation that he was nurturing. Yes. 
So he would have happily worked in Leipzig, stayed there, carried on happily with all of his wonderful relationships with work to get his kids the highest level of education that he could and then sent them off to build the future that he expected. Doesn't sound to me like a man that really wanted to go himself. Trying to get inside my grandfather's state of mind in those years, his two oldest children, my mother and my aunt, separately recounted in their last years a sad and very private tale of childhood sibling rivalry. And this led me to an unexpected discovery. Did you get on very well with all your sisters and brother? Um, there was always some slight, some. Um, um, how shall I say, sibling rivalry between my sister and me. Not so much from me, but uh, she... That's your second uh, sister. My second She uh, resented me somewhat, I think. She was perhaps a bit jealous because I, I suppose I attained things earlier than she did and that led to a little bit of squabbling. I used to tease her a lot and she hit back, you know, with... Uh, chasing me. <laughs> I was running around the dining table quite often, chased by her, and she caught up with me, she'd give me a scratch. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, this was childishness in those days. It wasn't uh, serious. But it was serious. That was my mother Lily talking in 1998, the last year of her life. A week later, I interviewed her sister, Rose, without telling my mother. Their relationship had long since completely broken down. Lily and Rose, the only survivors from their Leipzig family, and they no longer spoke to each other. Where did all this bad feeling start? Don't ask me, Michael. I don't like to talk about your mother, but she made my childhood an utter misery. She used to bully me. I have every uh, uh, sympathy for children who are being bullied. She used to bully me when we were children. You see, she was Papa's favourite, and she could twist him around her little finger. She sat down at the piano and played some uh, tune, you know, a sort of, uh, Hebrew uh, song, and he would smile and give in to her, you know, um, whatever she wanted. Well, quite a few years ago, she told me that an aunt of ours once said to her, why can't you be uh, nice or behave nicely like I do to Lily? So she took offense to me. I mean, was it my fault? And she's disliked me ever since. And she used to bully me no end. But if, I, if she found me with a boyfriend, she used to, you know, um, make my life a misery. I was frightened to have a boyfriend. Mm. What's the connection between this childhood squabble and Israel Gold's kind of Zionism? On the face of it, nothing. You're right. It does matter to know that cruel twist of fate that the two siblings who just couldn't get on with each other were the only two survivors from the whole family... But fair enough, why here? Listen on, Asha. I didn't expect what came up next, speaking with my Aunt Rose. You see, she was so full of herself. You know, she had such uh, a feeling of superiority that um, this is must have caused that. She felt that, that, you know, everybody should do as she says, you know. Was she indulged? Was she indulged too much? Was that... Look, there wasn't an enormous amount of indulgence, but if she said she wants something or she likes, wants to go somewhere or do something, you know, then, as I told you, she sat down and played this tune on the piano and, and you know, probably couldn't help smiling, and then she got her way invariably. You mean she regularly did that? Quite often, quite often, yes. I mean, I wouldn't say every day, but quite often. But well, this was a kind of trick of hers. Uh, yes, sure. Of course it was used. Do you remember the tune? Uh, very vaguely. Bar Menucha, it's called. You know, that was a song started, Bar Menucha. I can't remember the rest. How does it go? I can't remember. I can't think of it just at the moment. It's a long time since I heard it. The weary come to rest and finish their labours. 
pale night covers the fields of the valley of Jezreel. Dew below and moonlight above, from Beit Alpha to Nahalal. Jezreel is a fertile valley from the Mediterranean near Haifa to the Jordan Valley in the east. It was the focus of Jewish agricultural settlement in the 20th century. Beit Alpha and Nahalal were early cooperative settlements, kibbutzim, at each end of that valley. The land was bought from absentee Arab landowners and the Arab villagers evicted. This song, with words by Nathan Alterman, was commissioned for a 1935 movie, The Land of Promise, a documentary on Jewish settlement in Palestine, propaganda for the Zionist movement to encourage Jewish emigration. It was screened worldwide, including in Nazi Germany. Oh, what a night of nights. Silence over Jezreel. Sleep, dear valley, land of glorious beauty. We will guard you. The song and the film are a romantic vision of a promised land being reclaimed by hard labor, Jewish labor. The desert blooms again. When it mentions Palestine before the settlement, it talks of primitive neglect and empty spaces. Not even cactus grew in the sands. The sea of grain is swaying. The song of the flocks rings out. This is my country and her fields. This is the valley of Jezreel. But the film only has two of the song's three verses. This version by Kurt Weil uses the rejected third verse. Now the music's fragmented, uneasy. Mount Gilboa is darkened. A horse gallops from shadow to shadow. A voice carries high over the fields of Jezreel. Who is shot? Who has fallen? Between Beit Alpha and Nahalal. Guarding the kibbutzim was as necessary as farming them. Israel's own brother Yosef had to take his turn on sentry duty at his settlement. The Valley of Jezreel was not empty. It had been the Palestinians' dear land, tended and loved for generations, many generations. This song and its impact on Israel Gold opens a window into my grandfather's dilemma in those days. He must balance the threat of Nazi exclusion and violence in future against the actual escalation of violent confrontation in Palestine. What should he do? In September 1935, Nazi Germany enacted the Nuremberg Race Laws. Jews would now be subjects of the Reich, but not citizens. The doors of assimilation were closed. There was no future in Germany. Israel Gold wrote again to his brother in Palestine. I changed my mind. I don't want to send my two girls alone to Eretz Israel. On the one hand, it would be a painful solution because we don't wish to become estranged from our children at this time. On the other hand, I don't see any case for struggling so hard now, especially if I can't earn enough to live off. There's no Shabbat, no real happy Yom Tov, and no Fruen Tag. We live here very well, we eat very well and live together with all people in peace. And nevertheless, we are not happy people. We'd like to see a better future together with our children. Two weeks ago, I applied to the Palestine office to transfer my little fortune to Eretz Israel and emigrate there. After the sale of the house and settlement of all liabilities, we would probably have 30,000 marks. I learn Hebrew and English now. I'd like to learn Arabic too. 
He was even teaching himself Arabic. Arabic, really? Yes. When Israel Gold wrote how fine it would be to communicate and to live in peace together with this similar race of people in future, he meant it literally. That's why he would need an Arabic dictionary. And this shows the difference between my grandfather's Zionism and mainstream Zionism. In 1937, Ben-Gurion, Israel's future first prime minister, clarified his idea of Jewish-Arab relations, writing to his son, We must expel Arabs and take their place. If we are compelled to use force to guarantee our right to settle there, our force will enable us to do so. A Jewish state must be established immediately, even if it is only in part of the country. The rest will follow in the course of time. I suppose you know that the authenticity of this quote is disputed. I do. And yes, indeed, Ben-Gurion's words have been debated and disputed. His handwritten letter to his son Amos does include the words, we must expel Arabs and take their place. Mm -hmm. Mm. But there are also some crossed out words which read, we do not want to and we do not have to, which <laughs> seem to turn the claim on its head. So, what's going on? In fact, until 1937, Ben-Gurion's position in private seems to have been, we do not want to expel Arabs, but we will if we have to. And then, in public, and to Jewish peace movements, such as Brit Shalom, whose goal of a Jewish-Arab binational state was supported by my grandfather, Ben-Gurion insisted that a Jewish majority would arise by immigration and natural increase, and no question of population transfer. Mm. Only in private he was more candid. This is in private, as, as this, is a, this is a letter uh, to his son. It was a letter to his son late in 1937. Mm. Uh, and in 1936, the outbreak of the Arab revolt against growing Jewish immigration into Palestine reinforced thoughts of transfer. And that revolt also led to the British government's Royal Commission on the future governance of Palestine, headed by Lord Peel. And it was in July 1937, on the 7th of July, that the Peel Commission published its findings. Palestine should be partitioned into two states, Jewish and Arab. And to achieve the maximum separation of the populations, there would be mass population transfer, affecting vastly more Arabs than Jews. Mm. If the Arabs did not leave voluntarily, they would be compelled. And the Peel report was adopted by the British government, and it electrified Zionism for the first time in history. Here was a map published by a great power of a Jewish state, admittedly with narrow boundaries, but a state nonetheless. And as Ben-Gurion wrote, The rest will follow in the course of time. There's an extraordinary diary entry in Ben-Gurion's own diary five days after the Peel Commission report, and this is what he wrote. We are being given an opportunity which we never dared to dream of in our wildest imaginings. This is more than a state, government and sovereignty. This is national consolidation in an independent homeland. We must grab hold of this as we grabbed hold of the Balfour Declaration. If we do not succeed at removing the Arabs from our midst when a royal commission proposes this to England, it will not be achievable easily after the Jewish state is established. This thing must be done now. And the first step, perhaps the crucial step, is conditioning ourselves for its implementation. So this statement was made after the Peel report? It was made immediately after in and in response to the Peel report. And a few days later, there's another diary entry where he says, I made a list of Arab villages. And in fact, <laughs> alongside the name of each village, he entered the number of inhabitants. Mm. 
And he yeah. also commissioned a commander in the Haganah, the Jewish forces, to draw up guidelines for the takeover of Palestine after a British withdrawal. That plan developed over the next 10 years to the actual Jewish takeover in 1948, which we know today as the Palestinian Nakba. Mm. The seed had been planted in 1937 by the British. I find that just quite astonishing. The initial act of violence that accompanied the creation of the State of Israel, the violent expulsion mm. of 700,000 Palestinians, was a concept first put in writing yeah, yeah. by the British government. Right, yeah, I understand. Who knows that? Yes, knows I, was, that? I mean, is this information freely available? It is. A critical source is Ben-Gurion's own diary, which is in Israeli archive and in, uh, you know, the public domain. So what do you make in that case of his, I mean, the quote that we began with in the letter to his son? As I see it, the letter becomes entirely irrelevant yeah, in yeah. the view of the Peel Commission report, yes. <laughs> which became British government policy, and the way Ben-Gurion responded. And by the way, before the end of the year, there was one of the biannual International Zionist Congresses at which the Peel report and the recommendation for partition and the implication that there would have to be use of force was mm. accepted and adopted as official Zionist policy. All that happened in 19. 1937. I mean, I'm shocked, really. This direct connection between this, the Peel report and the Nakba is, is astounding. It is astounding. It was only a few months in 1937 when the British government did a U-turn and decided, no, 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 we, we can't do it. We're not going to do that. We'll do something else. Okay. Uh, and within a couple of years, they'd actually done a total U-turn and banned any further uh, Jewish emigration to Palestine, just as the Second World War broke out. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the British government managed to get it wrong spectacularly in every possible direction. At every moment, yeah. OK. But, I mean, nevertheless, it was still the, the report that Ben-Gurion's policies were ba based upon. It unlocked the floodgates. And, and we can hear in Ben-Gurion's own words just how it electrified him to see the dream of a Jewish state between the, the Mediterranean Sea and boundaries achieved on the back of mass expulsion of the existing native Arab population. To see that coming from the British government gave Ben-Gurion, who had no government behind him, no army behind him, that must have been a, a moment of complete revelation. And what of Israel Gold? A Zionist who sought one nation for two peoples, Jews and Arabs. Forced by Nazi Germany to leave, and struggling to find a way for his family to live in Palestine, my great-grandfather would not be happy with the newly aroused Zionist ambition for a Jewish Palestine without Palestinians. How that worked out, we'll be hearing in Keys, A Troubled Inheritance, an investigation by Mike Joseph into genocide, ethnic cleansing, and one family. This was episode seven, there's more information on the whole series at mikejoseph.wales. Do join us next time.